Hey, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the Cafe uh, Communities of Excellence or Excellence Communities. Uh, today we're going to be talking about mentorship, how to mentor and how to be mentor. And what we are doing is actually um, the same system as a uh, as the webinar that you can also find at the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity with a little bit of a tweak uh, for us. Uh, uh, but you will have um, in your um, in the Faculty Excellence Community Resource folder, um, which link is in the um, in our website. Um, you can find all the information and all the, let me just open this up a little bit. Um, let me see if this works. It doesn't work. Okay, great. Um, something happens with this now. Let me just stop here. Let me start it again. And I'm just going to say open link. Uh, here's a folder uh, with all the Cafe Excellent Community resources. The Every Semester Needs a Plan that we did last month uh, has uh, the recording. It has a lot of sample, sample plans and a lot of handouts. So you can always go back to it to see it. And then this is the one for today, Mentoring and Being Mentor. You have the handouts here and also uh, the PowerPoint. You actually can access all our resources by doing the following. You can go to our faculty landing page for MyCGU, and you have CAFE, Center for Academic Faculty Excellence here. If you go to CAFE events, this is where you have information about the communities, and this is the link that you know leads you directly to our public folder with all the information. There's also in the public folder, there's also another folder that you may be interested in. We're going to be doing the chat GPT discussion in the second hour. Uh, and here we have been creating a lot of ideas, assignments. Uh, we have been creating also, I'm sorry, I just touched the wrong thing. Uh, the recordings of our, our chat GPT discussions. So that's another place to go. And also on top of that, um, here you have a dedicated web page in our website that has, again, a link to that SharePoint folder, uh, information about our discussions. And then we also just did a webinar. Uh, the link to the video will be available very, very soon. The webinar was last week. And we have the slides uh, and shall we explain how do we want to think about ChatGPT? Uh, the metaphor that Shelby uh, used during the webinar is that ChatGPT can be a calculator for writing. And I think that is a good one. Start kind of thinking that way. And then we have a STEM shared resources in development by educators. There's a lot of you know statements for your syllabi and, and things like that. So now that I have given you an, an overview of what is going on and where you can find more information, Let's start or continue uh, with our mentoring and being mentor uh, webinar. So when you think about the mentors that you have or the mentees uh, that you are connected to, uh, sometimes there is a couple of uh, mistakes, common mistakes or common beliefs that make us uh, not think that we are worth being a mentee or worth being a mentor. Uh, so, uh, for example, this idea that uh, we differentiate ideal from what is real. So, for example, it's really all about the work. So, it's just do great work and yeah, I'll be successful. I don't need, I don't need help because if I just put all the, all the, you know, all the effort on doing it, I should be fine. Uh, also, this idea that um, I will need, I will ask for help when I need it, but I don't want to be proactive about it because everybody is so busy and I don't want to bother anyone. There's another one about like it's related to the first one that is usually associated with hyper individualism. So, you know, I don't need a mentor because I can figure everything out myself or I don't need to be a, a mentor because people should be able to figure out things by themselves. Um, there's also the idea of perfectionisms. I will hold on to work 
until it's perfect. And until it's perfect, I will not share it with anybody else. And that kind of is another barrier uh, to being able to be in a good, a productive relationship with a mentor. Or also um, there's this feeling that you want to stay safe and playing it small. For example, I only connect with people in my department, in my area that I like uh, because I, I don't want to extend my network because it gets too complicated. Uh, and then there's the super, super supporting syndrome where uh, I can take care of everybody else's needs, uh, but I may be neglecting my own. Uh, and that taking care of my needs for, for help uh, is, insult, is self, selfish. So all these are kind of like um, limiting beliefs that prevent us from looking for a mentorship relationship. Um, this webinar is going to be focused on, uh, on the core curriculum from the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity is one of the uh, many webinars that you can have access to uh, using uh, this tool. You just have to go to facultydiversity.org and put your CGU email and you will be able to have access to these and other webinars. Um, and before we, and we already went through all this, I just didn't realize that. Before we go into that, um, why do we think that uh, it's important to have this webinar both with potential mentees and potential mentors. Um, think about if you, you, you have a reliable and a strong network of, men, of mentors. And if you're a mentor, think about your network of mentees. Are you spreading your influence and your support uh, wide enough? Um, are you struggling to cultivate those mentoring relationships as a mentee or as, as a mentor? Like, Do you know how to offer support or do you know how to ask for support? Do you know the difference between a mentor and a sponsor? And are you moving to a new stage of your career and wondering how to find new mentors and sponsors that are appropriate for the next level? Because maybe you think that mentors are only needed when you're an assistant professor or when you're a junior administrator, uh, but you actually need different types of mentors as your needs for career development change. And therefore you have to like kind of map out what do you need and where or who is able uh, to support you with those needs. So today we're going to talk about uh, how you can uh, map your current mentoring network, how you can identify your unmet needs, and how you can plan on expanding your existing network to meet your current needs or to meet the, the type of support that you can provide to others. So I'm doing this exercise of kind of like flipping it. So people who are thinking about finding mentees can, can find this webinar helpful as well. So I wanted to just to take a moment uh, to talk about what mentorship is as a definition, like just a clear definition of what it is and what is what not is not. Um, so I have uh, capitalized the words that I think are important when we're talking about mentorship. So mentorship, mentoring is a reciprocal learning relationship. And I highlighted reciprocal because we think that the learning goes only in one direction from uh, top down, from mentor to mentee. Um, however, um, research shows that there is a reciprocal bi-directional relationship when we establish mentorship um, relationships. A lot of the times we think about mentorship as someone that is higher in a status or in position, but you can establish uh, men mentorship relationships uh, with peers where what you exchange is, is different resources from one to the other or similar resources where you just need a, a, a new set of eyes for your paper, for example, as a reader. Uh, so therefore, uh, when we're thinking about mentorship, we're thinking about a partnership and not just, a, again, a unidirectional relationship. And that's what different, is different from a supervision relationship. You can think that your chair in your department is your mentor, and it could be true that your chair is your mentor, but it's also true that your chair is not your mentor and that men your mentor is someone else in the department that is not your chair. Um, their work has to be collaborative. Um, and that's another 
aspect that is important in a mentorship relationship and is that there's collaboration in setting goals there's collaboration in in achieving those goals and it's not just a mentor is never someone who tells you what to do period without listening to what you have to say um so the idea of that that relationship works towards the achievement of, of mutually defined goals is important again because it's not even in the mentorship relationship it's not just someone that is going to help you achieve your goals but it's maybe is a relationship where that someone helps you to identify what are the goals that are worth pursuing based on your career stage and your needs for career development and then finally the idea is that the mentorship will allow to develop your skills your abilities your knowledge or your thinking and trust me when I say that as a mentor, by engaging in mentorship relationships, you also modify and enrich your skills, abilities, knowledge, and way of thinking. Okay, so the idea of this webinar is to rethink mentoring and in different ways. Like you may think, and we have a tendency to think that our PhD advisor uh, who was uh, now is your former PhD advisor now that you are an assistant professor or a tenure professor uh, will always be your mentor and they will always be able to support you throughout your career and all the needs that you have but the re the the interesting thing is that as we move in our career um it's a new game there's new rules there's written rules that maybe you know your former PhD advisor may know but there's a lot of unwritten rules that are based on the specific context where you are in higher education different institutions different fields um and also because you know life changes and the way that we are navigating our academic careers is changing as well um, there's going to be new challenges to navigate that maybe your formal advisor never had to navigate. Um, so the most efficient way of building each transition that you're making is to build a network of mentors, sponsors, and collaborators that meet new rank appropriate needs. So according to what you're going to need, you are collecting all those people that are going to help you. Um, when we think about mentoring, a lot of the time we think about a person who will be able to fulfill a lot of uh, needs for you. A person who will be able to have the role of helping you with professional development, emotional support, who's part of your intellectual community, who's going to be a role model, who, who is there for accountability. So, um, and also a sponsorship, like ability to, you know, uh, get you in, in a short list or put a good word for somebody or support you when you're applying for a specific things, writing letters, uh, access to opportunities, very similar, and then that give you substantive feedback. But if you think about that, that's kind of a big um, uh, description of a position for a mentor that they actually are able to do all these things. So when we rethink mentoring, the way that we rethink mentoring is asking, you are the person in the middle of it. It's not the mentor, it's the mentee, the person that is in the middle of it. And then the person, the faculty member or the grad student or the administrator needs to say, okay, what do I need and how can I get it? Uh, so do I need help in trying to figure out my professional development? Okay. Who should I go to get that information or that support? I need someone that shows me uh, how to really be a balanced faculty member. So I'm going to be looking for role models that are good academics, successful academics, but also are successful fa family members that take care of their family and their friends or chosen family um, or their pets. And they they seem happy people. You don't want to have a role model that is working until 10 p.m. every single day in their office, and they see their children every other week when custody says so. Right? Like that's not the role model that you're looking for for having a balanced life. Uh, but that person may be a great person to give you substantive feedback on your manuscripts. 
So don't scrap them, just ask them to do what they actually are best at doing that you need, okay? And this looks like a very utilitarian, practical, pragmatic viewpoint, and I know that you are thinking that, uh, but less, this is just kind of like the way that I'm saying it feels like that. But when you think about it, you cannot ask the same person for all these and it's better to spread the load. And it's always good to think about that you cannot do it all alone and that there's going to be people looking for opportunities also to mentor you. And now I'm thinking about the more senior faculty and that may be attending this is can you think about the things that you can offer people? Maybe you recognize that you're the person that is a worse role model, but also you have a lot of experience doing certain things. So maybe you can go to a junior faculty member and say, hey, do you need anybody uh, to do friendly reviews for you before you submit, for example? Okay, so these lead us to uh, really the actual um, learning outcomes or the plan for the session today that is, if we want to do that, like try to figure out what do we need and where can we get it and how we can ask for it. What we want to do is assess first our current net net network. We want to identify our current needs. Uh, we want to ask ourselves, how can I get my needs met? Uh, and then plan to maximize your opportunities uh, for that. Uh, identify your limiting beliefs, like I can do everything now by myself and then commit to action. So those are six steps that we're going to go through. Usually I will give you time between a step and a step uh, to do them, but because this is kind of now becoming a webinar uh, or an offline asynchronous webinar, what we're going to be doing is I'm going to tell you spend this much time doing this. So stop, um, uh, stop the recording, think about this, and then once, once you're gone, come back. Okay. So remember, the first thing that we need to know is what do we need from all of that and how can we get it? So step one is creating your mentoring map. And in the resource folder that I told you, you have a handout that you can print out, print out and you can fill out or you can get post-its and do like different things with post-its and put it in your wall or whatever creative and imaginative way you want to do it. The idea is that, okay, so who do I have do I need substantive feedback? Yes, okay. So what are the department colleagues that already give me feedback? Uh, and who are professional editors that already give me feedback for that? So this is not what you need, but what you have. Do we have senior faculty in your department that can sponsor you and, and help you navigate, for example, um, a tenure and review process? In terms of access to opportunities, do you have on-campus mentors? Do you have peer mentors? Do you have off-campus mentors? And all these people that can give you links and connections to resources and other people. In terms of accountability, do you have someone that really can call you and say, don't be, sorry, I cannot say this in a webinar. Um, I want to, <laughs> I want to see the manuscript submitted by, you know, the end of the, of the month. You need to do this, right? Like sometimes co-authors are the best on keeping you accountable. And those are very good co-authors and collaborators because you, you are afraid of them. The other day I had a discussion with a grad student uh, who had failed to come to my meeting and they said, well, but, you know, I need accountability. I'm like, you are not afraid of me, so I don't know how I can give you accountability anymore. You don't come to my meetings, like you just blow them. So I don't know, how, how can we do this? Do you need accountability with maybe your family or do you need accountability with like a public reprimand? Like in the lab meeting, I say, hey, you never came to our meeting. I don't know, I'm not that, I'm not that bad. I'm not, I'm not rude like that, but I was asking her or them, like, is this, is this a way of doing it? <clears throat> who are the people with whom you can have a safe space? Do you have people with whom you can discuss your darkest secrets uh, in relationship to your academic career uh, or even your well-being? And, and in safe space, you can include also a therapist or a profession, professional help that you actually have access to. Uh, who is in your intellectual community? Who are the readers that are available to to bounce at the, between the zero and 
progress in a project to bounce ideas with? Who are the people that you know are available for developing half cook ideas? Who are the people that can help you and give you read you know read something that is almost done and they just you just need a little bit of a push with that. Uh, so because you can, you may even have people for you know the beginning and then people for the end. They don't have to be the same person. Role models again, good role models, balanced role models, emotional support. You don't need to get all the emotional support from your colleague departments. You may not get your emotional support from your colleague departments. Uh, so maybe it's other people in the institution or maybe your friends on your family. Do you have people listed for it? And then professional development. Do you have people on campus and off campus that can help you navigate ideas about career development, transitions, uh, um, editorial uh, roles in journals and things like that? So you will take around 10 minutes to do this. So you're going to stop uh, the recording right now, download or, or create your own uh, working document and start uh, doing this. Okay, welcome back. So you have done all the <laughs> mapping and in order uh, to move forward is you're going to do circles around the places that you still have empty that you haven't been able to identify anybody anywhere there, okay? It looks like I have it pretty empty, but it's just because I, I didn't take the 10 minutes like you did. Um, so once you have identified the circles, now what I want you to do is step three, that is get one, get one of those circles. That's one of your missing piece. Get the one that is more important for you because maybe you may have circles in a lot of places, but you're like, you know, actually, I really need accountability and I have a big circle here. Or I need readers. I'm sending all my manuscripts I read to the journals and they're getting I'm getting desk rejections and I don't know what to do. Okay, so put it here, missing place, missing piece, intellectual. What are the things now that you can do to actively get that missing piece fulfilled? So brainstorm ideas about how do I find those readers? So for example, may I email uh, my colleague who does something similar to what I do? May I get back to my graduate school um, colleagues and see if anybody is interested in on, um, exchanging papers to for friendly reviewers? Uh, is a conference is coming up. Um, is there a session where I can identify a couple of people that work in the same area that may want to be friendly reviewers. So there's a lot of ideas that you can come up from one to six uh, in terms of how do you fulfill that missing piece. So I'm going to give you five minutes. So stop uh, the recording and put your timer on, tell Siri or Alexa to do a timer for five minutes and then come back. Okay. So now that we're back, we're in the step four. Uh, so you you are going to even like be more focused on what you can do. So we're still in that missing piece. So now think about, okay, in your next conference, what are people that you want to approach? Or people that already has what you want or not in your next conference, but in, really in, in, in general. And what, who has expressed interest in your work in the past? Who has said, oh, you know, I read, I read your paper and I found it very interesting. Try to like squeeze that brain, trying to remember who are those people, put them there and then below, put an action that can help you connect with them and try to get them to ask uh, for support from them. So another five minutes, stop, rec uh, stop the recording, put the timer and I will see you in five. Okay, now you have a plan. You have, you know the missing piece. You have thought about, you know, potential things that you can do. You actually have thought about a specific people that you can reach out. And you also have figured out uh, what would you do to reach out to them. Now, you're going to identify your limiting beliefs because I'm sure you're thinking at least one of these. Who I am to contact. If I'm just 
you know, a very junior faculty student, who I am to contact this person that is a very good um, person in the area. Well, academics, we love our egos and we love it to be, love them to be stroked. So, you know, actually when you contact somebody, at a minimum, they're going to be so pleased. They're going to be very happy that you contact them. They may say no, but as I always say, you always have the no. If you don't do it, you will never get the yes. So you just contact assuming that the no is coming. And if a yes is coming, this is great. Uh, my work isn't ready to show anyone is not good enough. Well, that comes back to your perfectionism or your idea that everything has to be perfect. One thing that I do with my students, they are not submitting things, is that at some point I'm like, okay, I want an ugly draft. Just an ugly draft. I want to read something because, because you're waiting to get it perfect. I'm not reading anything and I cannot give you feedback on, on, on nothing, on zero. So I establish expectations saying, it's going to be an ugly draft and I'm okay with an ugly draft. I just want to see your thoughts. I don't need to see that they are beautifully written. Um, so for example, when you are, um, remember when we were talking uh, about zero to 25%, 25% to 50%, you can establish the expectation when you are connecting people saying, it's a very rough idea, but I would love to like, you know, talk about it with you. Or it's a very rough draft and I'm in a point where I don't know where to go or how to better define the paper. Um, can, you, can you help me with that? So if you establish ex expectations from the beginning, you shouldn't be worried about that your work isn't really ready or good enough. I may be rejected, embarrassed or humiliated, Again, the worst that can happen is that they say no and that they don't have time. Yeah, we have big egos as academics, but we also have, most of us have souls and hearts. So we usually would say, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have time for that. And a lot of the times what has happened to me is that they say, no, I don't have time. But actually my colleague X, Y, Z would be very happy uh, to, to help you. And then your colleague X, Y, Z called you and they're like, why did you send it to me? No, I'm just joking. Um, okay, I don't have the time or the resources to start doing this, to go to conferences, to network. Okay, well, you're not going to go to four uh, conferences because, because you can, you don't have time to do that. But if you go to one, make it count and try to think about your mentorship map and your needs when you go to the conference. Instead of trying just to go to all the sessions and to you know get advantage of all the knowledge, conferences are also they are not only there for you to listen to papers and other people's work, conference actually are built for networking and creating connections. So you just have to use your mapping to actually identify who are the people in that conference that are coming that you may want to focus on connecting with. Um, nobody has ever helped me in the past so nobody will help me now. Well, you never know. Again, the no, you already have it. If you don't ask for it, you will never get the help. And then it will be even harder and tougher to get where you want to go. Uh, I'm afraid of, yes, we're afraid of a lot of things. But again, the worst that can happen is that they say, no, I don't have time. Or I don't know where to find this person or their email. Well, if that person is not easy to find, go to the next person on the list. But you all call, that could be another way of getting another mentor or another person to support you uh, to provide you with that information that is hard for yourself to find. So now we're thinking about mentorship can be scaffolded in terms of what, what you need that can lead you uh, to different types of resources. So if you identify your limiting beliefs uh, and check which one are they, then you can think about ways that you can deal with them, right? Because sometimes they're automatic, they're unconscious, you're not aware of them. So let's identify them and let's write it down, that write them down and then think about how you can change that belief. And then finally, uh, once you have done that, I'm going to give you another five minutes to commit to action. What are the three actions that you can take this week to move forward with figuring out your mentorship? Uh, so if you're a mentee, again, what are the things that you're going to do to connect, to commit to going to a conference, even if you don't have a paper? Sometimes I have much more fun 
sorry, I have much more networking ability when I don't have sessions uh, because I have a lot more uh, time to connect with people and to have meaningful conversations because that's the important thing. You don't want to go to people and say, hi, I'm Gloria, you are great. Can you read my paper? That's not how it works because, and maybe that's how it looked like it works, but it's more like, hey, I'm Gloria, I'm working on this thing. I really love your session about this. What do you think about this and that? Do you mind if, you know, do you have some time for a coffee later or are you going to be going to one of the receptions? Uh, so you kind of try to be personable and, 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 and have something to give as well. Like you have to be pleasant enough for people to want to work with you. Uh, so yeah, write three things that you want to do. And if you're, if you're looking for mentees, write three things that you want to do in terms of like, what are the things that you can offer and how, how you want to offer a junior person in your department, for example, uh, to have a coffee, just offer to have a coffee. You don't need more. During the coffee conversation, you will figure out what that person needs, or at least you can use this to tell them, Hey, Cafe created this webinar about mentorship. Maybe you want to look at it and do all the work with it and what maybe we can do it together and then figure out how I can connect you better throughout the institution. So those are things that you can do as uh, someone uh, who's a little bit more senior uh, trying to find mentees. And, and that's it. Um, you only spend one hour um, because you have been, you know, stopping the recording. This has been like 30 minutes, so it's good. <laughs> Do we have any questions in the audience? We have people here, we have people online. 